Before we get into the Word of God this morning, first of all, I wanted to uh, just say a few things about uh, our ministry to Japan. First of all, I wanted to thank you all. Thank you all for being our sending church. Uh, thank you all for pouring so much into the lives of uh, both myself, my wife, and my family. And thank you for your prayers for us and for your financial support of our ministry. We're looking forward to, to leaving uh, in December, toward the end of December of this year. We currently have a little more than 93% of our support, so we're just looking for our last few uh, partners, our last few churches, before we can go to Japan. Uh, some of you are new here. I don't recognize your faces, which is always a, a good thing when I come back and uh, see people I don't know. Um, but some of you uh, don't get uh, detailed information about our ministry, what's going on, that kind of thing. So we have a, a, a table set out in the lobby. If you will uh, sign up for our email newsletter, we'll be able to keep in touch with you and let you know uh, detailed ways to pray for us. Also pick up a new prayer card that we have. This one has uh, Phoebe on it. And uh, she looks a little older. Of course, we all look a little older in the picture. But, uh, but she's, uh, she looks like a two-year-old now. So uh, pick up one of those and put it on your fridge or wherever you keep those. And please, please pray for us. I'm excited this morning to be wrapping up the missions month here at Grace. And uh, we look forward to what the Lord's going to do in and through the Word of God this morning. This week, I was reflecting on how we are soon going to be leaving for Japan, how you're going to be sending us there as missionaries, and, uh, and what that is going to be like. And the Japanese people are a very, uh, very sophisticated people. They have very high technology, a very ancient culture. They have been there in Japan for more than 2,000 years. They have a radically different language, a radically different uh, way of life. And I, as I was reflecting on that, I thought it would be helpful for us all to be on the same page together and to reflect on Paul's ministry uh, to a people that were similar in his day. And so what we'll do this morning, we'll be reading out of Acts chapter 17. If you go ahead and turn with me there. What we'll do is we'll, we'll work through the, uh, the story, the history here. We'll notice how God is at work in the life of Paul and in the life of the people in Athens. We'll make some observations, some parallels with uh, Japan and with America. We'll look to Christ for guidance and we'll make a point, uh, several points of application. The majority of our time this morning will be in Acts chapter 17, verses 16 through 19, but I, we need to look at the entire situation, so we'll read a little bit more context starting in verse 13. Now, we're going to be reading a pretty big passage, so try your hardest to stay focused and to, uh, to pay attention to what is going on. Let's stand as we read. If you stand with me in honor of God's word, we'll start in verse 13, and we'll read all the way down to verse 34. But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea... They came thither also and stirred up the people. And then immediately the brethren sent, Paul, uh, sent away Paul to go, as it were, to the sea. But Silas and Timotheus abode there still. And they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens, and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus for to come to him with all speed, they departed." Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city was wholly given to idolatry. Therefore, disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, What will this babbler say? Others, some... He seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. 
And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is? For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold, silver, or stone, graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commendeth, commandeth all men everywhere to repent." Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard them of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. Howbeit, certain men clave unto him and believed, among the which was Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you for what you were doing among the church, among the early church, how you were taking the gospel uh, first to Jerusalem and then to Judea and uh, then Samaria and the ends of the earth. And as we looked at the history this morning, as Paul was taking the gospel to the ends of the earth, we ask that your spirit would move in our heart and that likewise we would see how you are sovereignly at work to take your gospel to the ends of the earth in each one of our lives. We ask that you would challenge us to be Christ-like. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen be seated. Christians, God has sovereignly sent each and every one of you on a mission to proclaim God's glories in Christ Jesus to the ends of the earth, even where you are here in America. Now, Paul was sovereignly sent on that same mission in his day. And just as Paul faced opposition, you will likewise face a measure of opposition. Now, I'm not talking about tribulation type of opposition. I'm not talking about violent opposition. What I'm talking about is a social opposition, like we see here in this text. But the opposition that you face is not without purpose, and it's not without hope. It's actually part of God's plan to bring himself glory. So let's go ahead and we'll work back through the text. We'll observe how God sovereignly accomplished bringing himself glory in Paul's day and how he's sovereignly bringing himself glory through similar circumstances 
today. So go with me to verses, uh, verse 16. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. So let's think back through the context. What just happened in Paul's ministry? He was in Berea. He was there with Silas and Timothy. He was there to preach Jesus. And the Jews found out that he was going to be, uh, that he was preaching there. And so the Jews, they came there from Thessalonica and they wanted to stir up the crowds against Paul. And Paul ends up being sent away from his time there in Berea by the sea and arrives in Athens. Now normally when Paul would arrive in an area, what we would see him do, first he would go to the synagogue, he would preach to the Jews, and then he would preach Jesus to the Gentiles as well. But in our text, what we find is that he's waiting on his friends Silas and Timothy to return from Berea before he starts preaching in Athens. That's what his plan is, the text says, now while Paul waited for them at Athens. Paul for whatever reason, he didn't want to preach Jesus by himself. He wanted his friends to be with him. That's why he was waiting. Now, before we move forward in the text, we need to view this passage through the lens of the context, through what God has done already. God has Paul right where he wants him. We see in the previous chapter, in chapter 16, verse 7, that God has the sovereign ability to ensure that people are in the right place at the right time. Back in chapter 16, verse 7, it says, After they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. The Holy Spirit sovereignly was preventing Paul to go into uh, into Bithynia, even though that's what Paul wanted to do. And here, in the situation we find here, Paul wanted to be in Berea, but because of the persecution, he was sent away. It didn't say that Paul wanted to go away. It didn't say that Paul wanted to depart. It says that he was sent away, and here he is in Athens. He's alone. He's without his friends, and he is right where God wants him, according to God's sovereign purpose. So according to God's plan, let's look at it through that lens. Verse 16, Paul waited for them at Athens. Now let's get a picture of Athens in our mind. Most of you have never been to Athens before, so let's think about Athens for a little bit. Athens was not some backwoods barbarian outpost. Athens was a great, uh, a great city, a great civilization. If you look at the ruins of Athens today, you'll see that 2,000 years ago, they were very advanced as a people. They had very advanced architecture and art and uh, religion and philosophy. And at that time in history, most of us are aware that Rome was the military superpower. They were in, on the top of the world militarily, but Athens would have been on top of the world culturally. So they were cultural elitists. They, they knew they had an advanced culture, and they were proud of it. Athens even had a thriving tourism industry. There was literature that was copied by hand and sent around to people telling, here's what you can come and see in Athens. So people would travel to Athens just to hear their philosophers, to see their idols, to see their great art and architecture. They were sophisticated and advanced culturally in the ancient world. So let's go back to our text, verse 16. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city was wholly given to idolatry. Now, Paul, he had traveled all through the Roman Empire. He had seen idols before. 
in his travels. But in Athens, there was an excessive amount of idols. Literally, it means that they were rich in idolatry. They had a ludicrous amount of statues there for people to worship. Now, why would God sovereignly put Paul in a society that was very sophisticated and had a ridiculous amount of idols. Why would God do that? Why would God put us in his sovereignty, you and me, why would God put us somewhere at a certain time? Ephesians 2.10 tells us that we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Paul was a person that belonged to Jesus. He belonged to Jesus to do good works. And the good works that Paul was about to do, they had been prepared long before in God's sovereign plan. He had ordained that this situation would happen. That's why Paul was waiting alone among the idols in a circumstance that seemed to be out of his control because God had something there for him to do. So let's see how Paul deals with the idolatry internally in his inner man. Verse 16 says that his spirit was stirred in him. Now being stirred in his spirit is in, would have been in stark contrast to the normal response of the people of his day to the idols in Athens. Remember, the idols in Athens, they were well known. People traveled there to see the idols. The Athenians would have responded in great appreciation for the idols. But what we don't see is we don't see Paul responding saying, wow, these these." Idols, look at how greatly they're carved, and look at how greatly they're painted, and wow, I appreciate how they accent the people's lives in Athens. That's not what you see him do. What you see is he responds internally by his spirit being stirred in him. The most literal translation of his spirit being stirred in him is that his spirit was being provoked. Now, you need to understand that the emotional response, him being provoked, that's not one of heartbreak, and it's not one of sadness. His being provoked is meant to point us back to the Old Testament, to God's response to idols, to him being provoked. In Isaiah 2.8, God said of the house of Jacob, Their land also is full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. In Isaiah 65, 3, God described his people Israel as a people which provoketh me to anger continually to my face that sacrificeth in gardens and burneth incense upon altars of brick. When people that God himself created oppose him and they dishonor him, they want nothing to do with him, and instead they worship something that was made with their hands, God doesn't say... Well, look at what they've made. Look at how creative it is, how deep and how full of cultural beauty. I appreciate their work. No, God becomes provoked by idolatry. He becomes angry within his spirit. Why? Why is God angry at idols, you might ask? Because in Isaiah 42, 8, God says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. All glory belongs to God, 
He calls it my glory. All praise belongs to God. He calls it my praise. It doesn't belong to idols. It belongs to God alone. And when people take that glory and praise and give it to something that has been created, God reacts by being provoked because he's holy. All people in the world know that there's a creator. In Romans 1, Paul says that God shows it to everyone. They know of his divine power and his divine nature. And therefore, it is morally wrong for people to worship something made with their hands instead of worshiping the creator. God becomes angry out of his holiness as a moral response to that. But we praise him for his holiness, but that's not all there is to God. God is more complex than that. We see in his character, we see that he gives common grace to all mankind. He causes the the rain and the sun to fall on us all, to the just and the unjust, the Bible tells us. He shows us his patience. He shows us his mercy. He shows us his love. To his church, he shows us his saving grace. He shows us his great love. Paul tells us in Romans that he demonstrated his love for, uh, toward us, that and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God responds, God acts out of holy provocation, him being provoked, but it doesn't end there. He also acts out of a love, and he entered into our reality And he showed us who he is, specifically through Jesus Christ. And likewise, Paul, as he's provoked, as he is emotionally irritated and angry because of the excessive number of idols that he sees around him, he responds likewise out of a holiness, but also out of a love for the people of Athens that shows them who Jesus Christ is. He entered into their reality and showed them the glories of Christ. Verse 17, Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with him that met with him. Notice the therefore in the text. It was because of Paul's being provoked that he responded in action and he disputed in the synagogue and with the devouts and in the market. So here's the principle that we derive from the text. The principle is that, like Paul, when God puts you among idol-worshiping people, he does it for his own glory. When you sent Janelle and I on our survey trip, those of you that were here, Um, back in 2010, when we went on our survey trip to Japan, we saw idolatry there. And it was likewise excessive. We went all over Japan. We traveled to big cities. We were in Tokyo with 35 million people and with skyscrapers all around us and modern architecture and modern technology. We traveled south to to more uh, rural farming villages where um, the, the architecture was ancient, and you, there were still buildings that had been standing for more than 500 years there. And no matter where we went in Japan, we saw idols. And it didn't matter if it was, um, it, it was on, the, the, on the sides of sidewalks and in grocery stores, and we saw priests, Shinto priests, parading these idols through the street. I can remember one time we were uh, down south and we, uh, we were just walking around town with another missionary and there was a, a hillside that was covered in thousands of stone statues, these little idols. The idolatry we went was, ex- uh, what we saw was excessive. 
when we went to Japan. And no matter where we went, no matter what time of the day, no matter what day of the week it was, we always saw at least one person, if not lines of people waiting to give offerings to these idols, to burn incense to them, to give, uh, to give them little baskets of fruit, to uh, give them different kinds of alcohol, and there's all these offerings that were even money going to these idols. My point is that the cities in Japan are wholly given to idolatry. Now, here in the United States, your society is not excessively filled with statues that give people, that, that people give their worship to like we saw in Japan. Now, sure, if you go out of your way, if you go to a you know, a Catholic church, or if you find a, a, a Buddhist temple or something like that, you're going to see some religious icons that people venerate and people worship. But for the large part, our public society, life outside of religious properties, is largely devoid of, this icon, uh, uh, of these icons. We live in a secular society without religions that uh, without religious objects that point us to supernatural things. So we, if, living in a secular society, we have to ask ourselves, the praise and glory that is to be given to God alone, what is it in our society that people give their praise and glory to in everyday life? In a society that's void of religious statues. What is it that, like Paul, when you see it, your spirit should be stirred within you, and you should respond out of a holiness and a love to people, bringing Christ into their reality, showing them the glories of God in Jesus? The general answer is that in a secular society, it's simply anything Uh, An idol is simply anything which takes the place of preeminence that is uh, the place of worship, the place that Christ alone deserves. The object that's worshipped in a secular society, it it can take different forms. It can be in the form of just normal, everyday things in life, even necessary parts of life, like a spouse or a child or your career. Um, Normally those things are just, you know, they're normal parts of life, but when they become preeminence, when they become first, when your whole existence is wrapped around that one thing and you find your identity in that one thing, that is the idol. It's also, um, in secular societies, you could be your own idol takes on the form of self. You just live for what you want. You're the preeminent one. You're the one that your life is centered around, not God. That's a form of idolatry. Also, in secular societies, it's common, less common here in the Midwest, but it's common for the very universe itself to become the object of worship. You see that in secular peoples that have a more Eastern philosophy. They live their lives to find harmony with nature. The creation is being worshipped instead of the creator. Again, the principle is that like Paul, when God sovereignly puts you among an idol-worshipping people, he does it for his glory. And we, each one of us, Each one of you, you can all say that you live among an idol-worshipping people. So how does God receive?